Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. I'm Meredith Applebaum, Assistant Dean of Students and Staff Advisor to our WJC Rainbow Alliance. Today we gather to recognize and honor National Coming Out Day. National Coming Out Day is always celebrated on October 11th, but since October 11th falls on a Sunday this year, we've chosen to recognize this important day a little earlier than usual. Uh, every year on National Coming Out Day, we celebrate coming out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. 32 years ago, on the anniversary of the National March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights, we first observed National Coming Out Day as a reminder that one of our most basic tools is, is the power of coming out. According to the Human Rights Campaign website, one out of every two Americans has someone close to them who is gay or lesbian. For transgender people, that number is only one in 10. National Coming Out Day continues to promote a safe world for LGBTQ plus individuals to live truthfully and openly. That being said, coming out is a process and for many, many people, it's not an easy process, which brings me to the introduction of our wonderful guest speaker for today, Dr. Jessica Stahl, who will be speaking with us about the complexities of the coming out process. But before I introduce Dr. Stahl, I just want to let you know that we are recording today's formal part of the presentation. Uh, we hold, uh, we'll hold a question and answer session toward the end of the presentation, uh, and that part will not be recorded. I just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, so please do hold your questions until after Dr. Stahl's presentation is complete. Dr. Jessica Stahl is an associate professor in the counseling department at William James College and has been working as a counselor educator since she joined the department in May 2009. Within the department, she serves as the director for students pursuing the general track of the clinical mental health counseling MA program. She earned her BA in psychology from Middlebury College and her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Stahl completed her pre-doctoral internship at Counseling and Consulting Services at the University of Minnesota and her postdoctoral fellowship at Counseling and Health Services at Salem State College in Massachusetts. Her clinical interests center on college student mental health, career counseling, LGBT concerns, and women. Dr. Stahl's research has focused on counseling, training, development, and psychotherapy process and outcome, and she has published a number of articles on these topics. Currently, her teaching interests include clinical skill development, theories of psychotherapy, diversity and difference, career counseling and development, and research methods. It is my pleasure to now turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Jessica Stahl. Thank you so much, Meredith. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about supporting the LGBTQ uh, plus uh, community through the coming out process. Um, and I'm actually going to get us started by having you do a little activity, a reflection exercise. Um, so what I would like you to do is on a scrap of paper um, or in the chat box, but don't send it. <laughs> Type, use the chat box for typing, but don't send it. Write down um, the first response that comes to your mind for each of the following prompts. So your job and what you do, the three most important people in your life, the three most important events that have occurred in your life, and three things you enjoy doing most in your free time. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Give you another minute or so to write. Once you finish writing, what I want you to do is we're going to do this as a imagination exercise instead of an actual interpersonal exercise, given that we only have an hour today. But I want you to Close your eyes and imagine that you're introducing yourself to someone you don't know, someone new. 
And when you're introducing yourself to them, you cannot discuss anything that's written on your slip of paper. So those are all topics that you don't share. Um, so whether you close your eyes or not, but just take a few minutes to sort of write the script in your head of what you would say and what the conversation, imagining what the conversation would be like to have a getting to know you some conversation with someone when you're meeting them for the first time without discussing any of these things that are on your paper. Well, if you've done this activity as an actual interpersonal activity before and you want to just reflect back on how it felt to actually do this when you were talking to someone, that's also fun. So <clears throat> I would like you all to think a little bit about what it was like to do this exercise and what you think it would be like to talk to yourself about, talk about yourself without mentioning the things on the paper. Um, what kinds, what, how you think not talking about the items on the paper would impact the kind of relationship you can build with people or a new person. <clears throat> We'll start with that. And if you have thoughts or reactions to any of those first three questions on the slide, um, why don't you just type them in the chat? That way we don't have to worry about whose turn it is and calling out names and stuff like that. And Meredith will moderate that for us. Actually, you know what, Dr. Stahl, we have a small enough group. I am mm -hmm. going to allow, uh, people, to unmute allow people to unmute themselves. We can get some um, different voices in the conversation. So if people would like to um, share, please um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and share. What was it like to do this exercise? What, what do you think it would be like to talk about yourself without mentioning the items on the paper? Sure. So what it felt like to me, it felt like holding in a breath, like it felt like not really being able to, it was like, I was like imagining like not sharing some of those, like those aspects. And it was like holding in a breath, not being able to just breathe out. And it was like imagining it was not a comfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jess, Dr. Stahl, you are muted. I was unmuted, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed that. Um, yeah, so feeling uh, uh, this uncomfortable feeling, almost like you're holding your breath, um, not being able to sort of let everything out. That's a great metaphor. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? I'll go. <laughs> um, I, I think that's a very apt... Uh, image, Hanley. Uh, as someone who lived in the closet for many years um, in Puerto Rico, and then when I moved to Virginia early in my career, I uh, back then there was no, there was also, if you try to talk in um, neutral gender pronouns, people look at you like you had two heads and what, you know, like you were hiding something. Um, 
which of course I was, um, if I wanted to talk. So I, I think that that's a very uh, apt um, way of saying it. It's like you feel like you're holding your breath and you feel like you are um, not completely authentic uh, all the time. And it takes a toll. You don't know, you really don't know how much it weighs on you until you know, your rights are recognized. I, remi I remember when um, the decision of um, marriage uh, in Massachusetts uh, was passed and it was like this like heavy weight that was lifted. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I think that that was, uh, that was a really good way of capturing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I agree. It was like one of those things for me that it was like, if I couldn't talk about these things, what like what kind of personality would I even have? Like, it just feels like, you know, of all of these things, it's like, what, what would I even talk about if I was trying to not talk about these things? And I think some of them are relevant, right? Like my sexuality, I am doing internship in Alabama right now. And so nobody at work or at the VA, I work at a VA hospital. Um, knows my sexuality or anything about my personal life a because under this administration it's it's almost like having to go back into a closet mm -hmm. um and so and it, i very much <laughs> recognized immediately what the exercise was even though i've never done it uh, because mm -hmm. it is so familiar for me um having to wear certain hats and hide certain aspects and mm -hmm. not talk about certain things yeah thank you for sharing that um it's very difficult to live like that um and you know, the last question is, how does this activity relate to being closeted and coming out? And the, the connection is pretty clear on the surface, right? That the things that oftentimes when people talk, when people who haven't ha experienced being in the closet reflect on it, they say, well, I don't talk about my sexuality at work. I don't talk about my relationship at work. Why, why does it matter? Why do we need to think about this? Why do, but it's part of every part of our lives, the, the way our life is peopled and the things we do it with our time. All of those things are connected to the types of relationships that we have and who we choose to have with our significant others in our lives or how we choose to identify our gender. Um, and present ourselves. And those things pervade all parts of our lives. And what I, that's why I like the, um, the list of things on the, uh, of things that we're not allowed to talk about is that who we are, who we are as people in the world and in our relationships and, as, and our identities are very connected to all of the things that we write down on that piece of paper. Um, and not being able to talk about them is very difficult. It feels very suffocating. It can feel like we can't let out a breath, like we're not being authentic. Um, it can be really challenging. Um, and there are a lot of ways in which um, people who are not heterosexual and cisgender, cisgender refers to people whose gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth. Um, we're managing that information every day, all day, and making decisions about how and when to talk about it. And that's what coming out is. Um, we have this uh, image from the media that coming out is something you do at the beginning of the process when you're just uh, figuring out that you might be lesbian or gay or bisexual um, or not, not cisgender, but it's really a process that happens throughout the lifespan. Uh, so I'm gonna keep going in the interests of time, unless, does anyone have any sort of last thoughts about this activity before I keep going? I think that it's important to note too that sometimes you are out in some, in some places and not in others. So you can, you have uh, to remind yourself, wait, what am I, you know, how do I project myself here or there? So it's yeah. not like some people are not out everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, and that adds, that's an added layer of sort of having to remember what you've said in which contexts and who you're out to and who you're not to and what the story is that you tell about your life in the different arenas that you're in, definitely. It's a lot of mental energy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so as a way of sort of preparing or pre precluding or preceding talking about the coming out process for um, LGB people and then also transgender people. I just wanted to briefly 
introduced the, the concept of the gender unicorn was a nice way of visually presenting what it is that we're talking about. So when we're talking about uh, sexual orientation, we're talking about the two continua here at the bottom, who people are physically attracted to and who people are emotionally attracted to. And regardless of one's sex assigned at birth and gender identity, one can be physically attracted to men, women, or other genders. And we can theoretically rate our sort of level of attraction on those different dimensions um, on a moment to moment level, if not sort of in a stagnant way. A lot of people who identify as bisexual or pansexual actually say that these continua don't, don't really represent their experience because they can't quantify it in quite this, in quite this way. Um, in addition, the gender unicorn has visual representation of the differences between gender, our sex assigned at birth, which is really based on our genitalia and whether our genitalia when we're born look more like female genitalia or male genitalia. Um, sometimes <laughs> doctors also have chromosome information from blood tests that were done usually during pregnancy to determine what the sex of the baby is. Um, so that probably weighs in too. Um, so that's sex assigned. Those things dictate sex assigned at birth. People who are intersex are people who are born with ambiguous genitalia. Um, so their genitalia might be unclear in terms of whether they're female or male. Um, for example, um, a child born with um, an enlarged clitoris and labia that looks not quite like a vulva and and a typical female um, genital genitals, but it's not quite a penis either. Um, so um, that's what intersex and that's what the I stands for and that's what intersex means. Um, and then when it comes to gender, we can think about our gender identity, which is how well how much we identify as male or female woman or man or as something not binary and then also how do we express ourselves so the identity is how, how do i feel inside and the expression is about how do i present myself in terms of my behavior my clothing those kinds of things so the main thing to take away from the gender unicorn is that all of these different pieces of gender and sexuality operate independently so it's not it does just because someone identifies as female and expresses themselves as female and were assigned female at birth, that person would be cisgender, but that doesn't have any dictation to how, who or who they might be physically or emotionally attracted to. And physical attraction and emotional attraction might not line up for lack of a better term. So identity development for LGBT people um, is the process coming out for, for people with uh, non-heterosexual, non-cisgender identities. Um, the, term of, the term we use to describe coming to terms internally with oneself and sharing with others um, that non-normative identity is coming out. Um, so it's accepting sexual orientation or gender identity as part of life um, and, and doing that in an internal way that where there's self-acceptance and then also doing that in an external way where one is sharing that identity with other people and that process is related to greater social support, improved relationships, lower psychological distress. Um, generally research says that especially youth who identify as LGBT um, and uh, don't feel safe coming out especially are at mo very high risk for low self-esteem, emotional isolation, poor school performance, um, suicide. There's a lot of uh, challenges for people, emotional challenges for people who don't feel like that this part of their identity is acceptable or accepted. So some barriers that can exist for people around developing a positive identity for their gender identity or their sexual orientation are the things listed on this slide, right? Stereotypes, negative stereotypes especially, lack of role models, isolation, having a denial of basic civil rights like employment and housing and child custody, um, uh, 
experiencing intimidation or physical violence. And one of the things related to the civil rights that I want to highlight um, is that even when there are laws protecting people's civil rights, that doesn't mean that discrimination doesn't still happen. We've had employment protections on the basis of sexual orientation here in Massachusetts for a long, for a while. I would have to look up the date. I don't know it off the top of my head. But after the time that employment protections for people on the basis of sexual orientation existed here in Massachusetts, one, there was a case where a man applied for a job as the food service worker at a local Catholic school. And there is a religious exemption for the employment protections law that says if so, if the job is directly related to religion um, and the institution determines that, you know, sexual orientation might somehow interfere with the ability to do that religious thing, then it's okay to exclude them from the job. But this guy was applying to be the director of the cafeteria. And he got the job and the day after he met with HR to sign all of his emergency contact paperwork and he listed his male spouse as his emergency contact, um, he was fired from his job. So he experienced employment discrimination, fought it with the help of um, an organization here in Mass, uh, legal organization in Massachusetts that's, I think it was GLAD, right? <laughs> I can't remember, <clears throat> the Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders. And, they, and he won because that was considered employment discrimination. So I use that as an example just to say that just be, employment, legal and civil protections are super important and discrimination still happens. Um, <clears throat> so the coming out process is something, one of the reasons I have a link to a movie called Anyone and Everyone at the top of this page. Um, it's available, it's a documentary on YouTube that you can watch on YouTube. Um, one of the things that's not on the next slides, but I just want to note here is that the coming out process is, we usually focus just on the person who's coming out, but it really affects everyone in that person's world. Um, the movie Anyone and Everyone is a documentary, not just of the, it's about children who came out as gay or lesbian, and it profiles not just the children themselves, but the focus is actually more on their parents and their parents process of coming to terms with their child's coming out process and the coming out process that the parents them themselves experienced. What's really great about it is that it has super diverse parents, uh, families in terms of race and social class, um, geographic location um, here in the U.S. So it's a great movie to watch about coming out um, for the whole family. Um, if you search anyone and everyone as a documentary on YouTube, you will see it. Um, and we'll share the slides um, at the end of the talk. And I think that the hyperlink should work in the PDF. But if it doesn't, search it in YouTube and it will be there. So my next slides are just um, going to be describing the process of coming out and then what are some things that we as clinicians can do uh, to support people through the coming out process. Um, and even if we're not working as clinicians, I mean, we here at William James, we're training people to be primarily mental health practitioners in some form or another. Um, but even if we're, if you're thinking about these slides from not a clinical perspective, but just as a, you know, supportive human being perspective, I think the things on the interventions side of the slide are still things that we, that are really useful to think about and to do. So when it comes to sexual orientation, um, at the beginning of the coming out process, the person who's identifying as lesbian or gay will start by having some often start by having some disturbing feelings that could be labeled as gay or lesbian. And maybe disturbing is too strong, maybe it's just uncomfortable or curious or questioning. Um, often this, pro this part of the process is done in isolation and there's some sense of coping with the loss of a heterosexual identity, a sense of feeling alienated or different. And when we're talking to someone who's in that phase and they share it with us, we wanna really empathize with the client's fear of isolation the ways in which they feel like they might be stigmatized for feeling socially different. Um, we can really thank them for trusting us with that information. And especially if we're working with them in a professional standpoint, in a professional context, we wanna assess for depression, chemical use, suicidal thoughts, because this is when people are, are very much at risk for those things. 
Um, we can also spend time talking about what cultural, religious, and family messages they've gotten about what it means to be lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So what, what do they, have they learned about what it means to not be straight from the world around them? In the mid phases of coming out, um, people might privately label themselves as gay or lesbian or bisexual and distance themselves from, but also distance themselves from their own homoerotic feelings. So they have this sense that, oh, I might be, or I, I guess I am, but not ready to really um, explore the, the, those romantic feelings explicitly. Um, in the mid phases, people are starting to look, try and get more information about learning what it is to be LGB. Um, and they might also really overvalue approval from heterosexuals, really want validation that they're not going to be ostracized for coming out as not heterosexual. In these phases, when we're working with someone, we can really empathize with any confusion that they might have, really discourage premature labeling. People might feel pressured to pick a label right away. And sometimes it takes a while for people to figure out what label feels most comfortable to them. And we can also talk about how labels might change over time. People, a lot of LGB people don't stick with the same label for their whole lives. So um, getting caught up on what label we're going to use can be something that um, we can discourage and sort of say, let, let's not worry so much about what label we're going to use and focus more on how you feel. Uh, we can explore fears that the client might have and encourage them to move beyond it. Um, we can challenge myths and stereotypes that they might have about what it means to be lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and really help them identify supportive others and role models. So the supportive others don't necessarily have to be other LGB people, although of course that's important and helpful. Um, but it can also be, um, you know, helping them connect with, uh, you know, which other heterosexual people might be really good allies in their life who would be someone that they can really trust and talk to about these things. In the final phases of coming out as LGB, uh, people will maybe initially tolerate, but eventually embrace this new identity, seek out other LGB people, um, selectively self-disclose identity. So disclose their identity in a mindful way that's sort of thinking about what might the consequences be. Um, finding an LGB as peer group and really acknowledging the full range of one's social, emotional and sexual needs. And in this phase, these phases, we can work with someone around validating their self perception, facilitating intentional coming out. So one of the thing, what that means is really encouraging people to think about what might the pros and cons be of the different strategies that they might use to approach coming out. So for example, if, some, if the client is talking about how their family is kind of critical and homophobic and tends to say pretty disparaging things about gay and lesbian people, but, but they don't know, um, and the client really wants to make an announcement at the beginning of Thanksgiving dinner to everyone, um, you know, my, we might want to say, let's think about what that will actually feel like. Like, what might the rest of the day feel like if you start Thanksgiving dinner by that, with that? Not that you shouldn't come out really making it clear that we're not discouraging them from coming out to their family members, but doing it in a way that's sort of like making an announcement at the beginning of a family time where we're all going to be now truck stuck at this table together for some undetermined period of time for the next couple hours or something like that, that is that really going to set them up to be is that they might be setting themselves up to be hurt um, and then we want to be protect help them be protective of that and be protective of that for them um, when people do experience rejection we want to frame it help them frame it as an external problem that this is about heterosexism in our culture um, and that this doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them um, but that this is part of um, heterosexism that exists in our culture and um, understanding where that those thoughts and feelings come from, from the person who they reject were rejected from and maybe grieving the loss of the connection with the person who they were rejected by. Um, offering community resources and then providing some human sexuality education, especially because a lot of young people, especially or older people might not have gotten much education about safe sex for um, non heterosexual sexual encounters. Um, so really helping them learn and be aware and knowledgeable about that to um, protect their physical health. 
So those are the processes of coming out as LGB. Um, when we're working, this, uh, this slide is just about LGB people of color, but it could say LGB, I mean, LGBT people of color, um, because the multiple oppressions piece certainly applies to people who are marginalized, both in terms of gender identity and in terms of sexual orientation. Um, so we want when people are minorities, both on their gender identity and sexual orientation, and also in terms of their race, we want to think about the multiple oppressions they might experience. Um, they might experience heterosexism and homophobia and transphobia in their cultural and ethnic group, but they might also experience racism and exclusion in the LGBT community. Um, <clears throat> many non-white cultures might see homosexuality as a white thing. Um, one of the clips in the, in anyone and everyone that makes me laugh every time is this woman, Asian woman, um, says she came out in the 80s to her parents and her, her mom says, I didn't think Asians could be gay. I told her she was making it up. She was reading too many books. Um, and, and now this, these parents who, you know, the mom was like, I was crazy in the summer of 1985 when so-and-so came out to me. I said all these ridiculous things and now we march in every, in every pie parade in California. Um, so really thinking about what is what's the culture piece and how might that really exacerbate the ways in which people have feel like they um, can integrate these different identities or not. Um, although there are also some cultures where pieces of the LGBT community are really incorporated into the culture. So for example, um, the, in some uh, American Indian and Native cultures, um, there are um, people who are considered two-spirit, um, especially in the Bedarki culture. Um, and people who are considered two-spirit are seen as sacred persons, born in balance. They're able to move between two worlds, easier to, it's easier for them to transcend from physical to spiritual realms. So there are some cultures, non-white cultures, that do have um, room and represented representation of people who are not totally heterosexual and cisgender in some way. Um, I already mentioned that Asian uh, mom in Asian cultures often it's seen as sh bringing shame to the family or abandoning one's primary role as parent and when the mom talks about, you know, the first thing she says is, I'm going to have to divorce your dad because you're gay. <laughs> I was like, I don't really understand the connection there. And the dad talks about going to a feminist bookstore to try and understand his daughter and when the person working at the bookstore asked him if, she ne if he needed help, he felt this cloud of Asian shame come down on his head. Um, so thinking about really, this is all just an example of things to talk about with people, right? How does your culture view this identity and how are you feeling about it? And how is it going to impact your relationships with the people in your family, especially? Um, in Latin cultures, it can conflict with Catholic teachings. Um, and for Blacks, especially African Americans, it can be seen as sinful or acting white. These are not always true, but they're things to explore with people. So my last couple slides are about transgender identity development and you'll see as I go through the slides that the process is pretty similar. Um, kind of the outline of the process is pretty similar to as it is for, L for LGB people. But really starting with some sense of awareness, realizing that one is different, experiencing some kind of de gender dysphoria, uh, feeling like one's gender doesn't really match how one feels internally, even if one doesn't have a label for what that means, just not feeling comfortable. Um, and that can come with some anxiety, depression, substance abuse, suicidality, self-injurious behaviors. Um, for some people, other people might feel some relief. So it's really important to ask open questions about what people are feeling about this starting to question, this beginning awareness. And we can respond to those questions or that beginning awareness by normalizing gender identity issues, um, helping the client see the connection between the gender identity concerns that they're having and stress or symptoms that they're experiencing and really providing people with safety and support and acceptance and really allowing the client to explore all thoughts and ideas that they might have. Do they want to transition? Do they not? Maybe today they do, tomorrow they don't. All of those things are totally fine. We're really just saying don't have to make any decisions about any of this. It's going to take time for you to figure out where you want to land and that's totally okay. Um, so really just saying, this is a period of discovery and let's just explore every, all the thoughts and feelings that you're having. Um, as people 
sort of move past just these initial awareness, they're going to try and seek and often try and seek information or reach out. So coming out to themselves and to others, seeking info about what it means to be transgender, looking to reach out to people who are like themselves. And that can come with a lot of excitement and feelings of transformation, but also fear of being found out. And we might also see uh, internalized transphobia. So people really um, applying the stigma around being trans to themselves. Um, and we want to make sure that we're educated through this phase. Um, we want to help the client find accurate information about what it means to be trans um, and re help them reach out for support. We want to help the client pace their emergence process and make choices about coming out, especially carefully and deliberately. As people move, continue through the process, they'll start coming out to other people. So disclosure to significant others. Um, and often people might experience sort of this feeling of being torn between this internal pressure to come out and share this newly discovered part of themselves with their loved ones, like their family of origin or their partners, and also some perceived, some pressure perceived or maybe real <laughs> external pressure to stay in. Um, they might be fearful of losing others, fear of fearful of being rejected or abandoned. So we might see symptoms of anxiety, depression, suicidality, could be unpredictable or dangerous behavior. Um, and, and once people come out, they might feel relief, especially if they experience support around that coming out process. So we're really trying to help people in this phase disclose to others in a thoughtful, um, self-protective way, um, and also integrate others' responses into their own um, process. Um, and often remember that help the client remember that their initial other people's initial reactions are often not their entire reaction. And actually, if nothing else, anyone and everyone is an awesome example of that because so many of the parents talk about how hard it was for them at first and how much they came to realize that this was just one part of their child and they still love their child and they still support their child. It's really amazing. Um, Dr. Stahl, if I can interrupt you for one moment, I know yeah. there's a scenario in that documentary that you and I just both love to pieces. One mom who just says, everybody deserves to go to the movies and share a bucket of popcorn with someone. Everybody mm -hmm. deserves to have someone come pick them up at the airport. Everyone deserves to have somebody come visit them in, in the hospital. So mm -hmm. just these very basic things that this mom, you know, saw, it just, it's, it's the, the human, the, aspect of the child, the child, everybody deserves that kind of um, mm -hmm. companionship. So I know, but I just wanted to point that yeah. out. It's a lovely yeah. part of the documentary. Everyone should go and watch it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you'll want to take that mom home with you. She's the more, the comes from a Mormon family and she says all the most like super profound things. Um, yeah. So I've, I think that that what's really lovely about that is that particular family, the parents were both very supportive from the outset, but even though they were Mormon, which is not what you would expect. So that's also something to think about and help our clients think about, which is that we, um, we, we and they might have stereotypes about how people in their lives might react um, and they, what they expect might not be what happens. Um, we still want them to be prepared for things maybe not going as well as as they would like um, so that we can have a plan. Um, but people might also be surprised, I guess. Um, so just to wrap up the transgender identity development, because I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, after exposing to significant others, there's this, there's this period of exploration where it's related to identity and self-labeling. Self so really exploring the meaning of what it means to be transgender and finding a label that best explains oneself. It may not be transitioning from female to male or vice versa. People might find that they land somewhere in the middle or somewhere that's not within the gender binary and that they identify as gender queer or some other term. Um, and they don't, or by gender, um, that that neither full one gender identity or the other really represents their sense, their internal sense of self. And we can validate all of those different possibilities. Um, people might start exploring their options for transition. 
Um, they may experiment with, quote, doing gender. That means performing the gender that's not the one that they've been performing <laughs> all their lives. Um, and they being concerned about passing. Um, and a lot of that can be very laborious, exhausting, painful, but also hopeful and transformative. So we want to honor all of the, the range of feelings that people might have in this period. Um, so we're helping people explore their identities, labels, options, the consequences of all of those things, and really have an open and an attitude of openness and advocacy, and making sure that when we address people, we're using their chosen names and pronouns. Even if that changes from week to week in session, we try to make an effort to you, we make an effort to make it clear that we're honoring what names and pronouns the person wants to use. And we can even model that by uh, that we're open and that we understand that people might not um, always use the names and pronouns that one might assume that they use by looking at them by talking about our chosen pronouns, right? So that's why now a lot, one of the things that we can do as professionals, especially in this Zoom environment where we always see each other's names <laughs> in our little squares, is put our pronouns in our boxes because that way we're communicating that we're aware that people might ha not use the boxes that we assume that they will have based on looking at them. And we can, um, it, it communicates that we want people to identify what pronouns they want us to use about for them and then we use them. Um, as the, the exploration stage often continues to questions related to transition and possible body modification. Um, so Consolid people are work on consolidating their gender presentation. They're also making decisions about what kind of body modification if they're going to do if any. Um, historically, uh, insurance companies have required that people uh, do some amount of quote real life experience, that's what they call it, um, before they can have access to surgery. That I think has been shifting some in some places, probably not in others. <laughs> um, so but that's one of the things that we might be navigating with the client is even figuring out if they want to do any kind of body modification, how are they going to access the medical serve appropriate safe medical services for that? Um, how are they going to, um, you know, what kind of insurance coverage would they have for those um, procedures or not? Um, and if not, you know, what is it? What do they cost and how would they pay for them? Those kinds of things. So in this part, passing, this questions of passing are often paramount. It could feel like people might feel like they should pursue surgery. Um, we want to really just uh, recognize and highlight the importance of people's uniqueness of their experiences and say there's no should of any of this. This is, it's really you, you figuring out what's best for you. So we want to monitor people's progress, offer support, make sure the client is aware of the range of choices that they have and really thinks through the implications of any choices that they make. Um, we might need to manage our own reactions related to whatever the client decides as far as surgery. Um, we may be asked to write referral letters for hormones or for surgery, um, helping the and help the client navigate physical and legal sex change. Um, they have, though my last slide has a has uh, resources. Um, one of the local resources where we as clinicians but also clients can get a lot of support around those things is Fenway Health. Um, so that's a place that we can go to for ourselves and for our clients around um, not surgery but hormones and letters for hormones and things like that. And then finally, integration at this sort of in the integration phase, people have acceptance for who they are and how they present with themselves and that, you know, navigating whatever post transition issues. Um, and Laverne Cox is a great representative of someone who's trans and out and very integrated. And this is just a, there's a series of trans people speak clips on YouTube, uh, videos on YouTube called I Am Trans People Speak. And Laverne Cox is, is one where she just talks about how she realized early on that because of her build, she was never gonna fully pass. Um, and that's, that's okay, but she's still a proud transgender woman. And this is you know, how she presents herself and what she sees as her, you know, her role and the way she uses her voice as a famous actress to sort of um, advocate for the rights of other trans people. So really the integration piece is um, having a, 
a sense of acceptance of oneself in this identity, you know, having a resolve around the gender dysphoria, being satisfied with adjustments that are made, regardless of how someone is living. They sort of have this internal sense of um, peace about sort of where they are in terms of how they identify. Um, there might be some continued uncertainty and fluidity or recognition that, you know, how I identify might shift and change over time. Um, but there is also comfort and pride in how one identifies. Um, and for these clients, we can just continue being a support and an advocate. Um, so I just wanted to have my last slide before we open it up for questions. Just some, just three basic resources as a place, as a starting point. Um, so the Human Rights Campaign is an advocacy, political advocacy group for LGBT rights in, um, in the U.S. And their, the link that's there is to their coming out page, so there's, which has resources for coming out, kind of brochures and videos. Um, what's nice about it is they have bro little brochures and videos for coming out in all sorts of other intersectional contexts, like I was looking at it earlier, there's, um, I actually have it here. Um, you can see that, whoopsies, there's one, um, you know, coming out as LGBT black people, Latinx, coming out at work, coming out to your doctor, different faith communities, um, religion and coming out, a glossary of terms, Islam, Judaism, there's three pages. Um, so this is a nice resource. P um, HRC has other resources as well. Um, they also have really cool maps that outline which states have legal protections for different kinds of rights um, for LGBT people. So that's another good resource for HRC. Um, and they also rate companies on how LGBT friendly their policies are. Um, so HRC is a great resource for all of those things. The Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays is a national organization that supports the rights um, that supports LGBT people and their loved ones. Um, so this is the link to the Greater Boston Plea Flag. And um, they have support groups, which are currently all being done through Zoom, so super easy to access. Um, and lots of other links to the programs and services they have, training and workshops to be um, they, well, their support groups are mostly peer led. So if you want to be an ally and lead groups for them, great. You can be a speaker for them. Um, they have links of resources, that literature that you can refer to. And then I already mentioned Fenway Health, which is um, an LGBT um, healthcare um, setting. It's in, they're on Boylston Street in Boston. Um, and they are um, a health center. They have all different kinds of physicians, they have mental health services, and they are a really awesome referral source, especially for clinicians around um, consultation around LGBT issues. Um, I think I'll say stop there for the uh, formal part of our talk. So we have uh, eight minutes, <laughs> according to my computer, five probably for someone else, because my Fantastic. computer is slow. Dr. Stahl, thank you. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was it was really wonderful. Uh, I know we're all grateful uh, to you for for this information.